Good morning. Good morning. I always sing it like that. Y'all can sing it back to me this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that sounded nice. <laughs> Welcome. Good morning to those of you at home. I hope y'all sang it with us. Those of you who are in the house this morning, if you could stand to your feet, we're going to get ready to just worship the Lord. We have gathered in his name to worship him. Amen. Amen. It's a little song I was singing in my head earlier when Brother Rodman was praying. It says, we have come into his house, gathered in his name to worship him. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Who's here to worship the Lord this morning? Oh, look at those hands. Yes, it's an honor and a privilege that we have to be able to gather together in freedom and liberty without somebody running us down, persecuting us, telling us you can't gather to glorify the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Can we celebrate that for a moment, that we have that liberty and freedom to gather openly with each other and lift each other up and encourage each other in the Lord? As we sing this morning, um, the first song is, is new-ish. You might know it. It's called Chasing After You. And the Bible says that the Lord is a rewarder of those who do what? Come on, I know I have some Bible scholars in the house. The Lord is a rewarder of those who? Diligently seek him. That means we're consistent, we're persistent, and just right on him, just like this. Like, hey God, I see you, you right there. I'm gonna be right up under you. Hey God, don't move without me. We can be like Moses that says, if your presence doesn't go with us. We not moving, anybody like that in the house? We're not moving without his presence. We're gonna be like David that says, earnestly I seek thee in the morning. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul thirsts for him. There is no one else who's gonna be able to satisfy us. There's nobody else who sustains us. There's nobody else who keeps us. There's nobody else who redeems us. There's nobody else who sanctifies us. There's nobody else who gives us peace. If we're not running after Jesus, we are going to be lost, amen? Father, this morning we thank you for your presence. We thank you that you have given us access to your throne of grace through the blood of your son. We thank you that the veil has been torn, that we don't need anybody else but your son to come before your throne. This morning we seek after you. We're chasing after you. We're running after your heart, after your will, after the things that you are doing in our lives and in this earth, God. We present ourselves to you this morning for you to have your way. We thank you for liberty. We thank you for freedom. We thank you for reconciling us to yourself through your son. We thank you that there's no other name but the name of Jesus, that at that name every knee must bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. We thank you this morning for redemption. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for the sanctify sanctifying power of your Holy Spirit. We stand this morning in awe and in gratitude of who you are. We ask you to have your way in our midst this morning. God, we need you more and more each and every day. Honor and glory be to you this morning. All God's people say amen. amen. Hey, we're going to let the band start us out this morning. Hit. Hey. Hey. Yeah. Chasing after you, no matter what I have to do, cause I need you more and more. That's the verse. I'm chasing after you, no matter what I have to do, cause I need you more and more. I'm chasing, I'm chasing after you, no matter what, no matter what I have to do, cause I need you.
No matter what. There we go. I need you. More and more. One more time, I'm chasing after you, no matter what. Yeah, there it is, cause I need you. Oh, oh, oh. oh more and more, we sing more and more. More and more. More and more. God, we need you. More and more and more. Chasing after you, Lord, I'm praising my way through just to be closer to you, Jesus. Oh, I'm chasing after you, singing with me. Say, say, I'm chasing after you, I'm praising my.
to love you more than before and I want to worship deeper than before if you've got liberty I need you to shout this morning This next part, we're going to actually pretend to be a choir this morning. Amen? Yeah. All right, so tenors, can you wave your hand at me if you know you're a tenor? Can you wave your hand at me? Any tenors in the house? I got a couple. Altos, where you at? Give me one of these. <laughs> Altos always in a bunch. Sopranos, give me a little hey. Oh, there they are. Those of you at home, pick your part, right? So tenors. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. Alright, tenors, try that with Richard. Here we go. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. Now it's time for the alto section. Y'all ready? Altos, give it to him. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I Free altos in the house, join with them and say, No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. Sopranos, it's your turn. Here we go. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. Oh, they're ready. Sopranos, ready. Do it again. Say, No more shackles, no more.
shout of glory and honor, a voice of triumph, because you have been redeemed, set free by the blood of the Lamb. Our minds have been cleared. Our consciences are cleared because of the blood of the Lamb. We're not held back by depression or fear. Hallelujah. Y'all glad this morning? Woo! Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus, for freedom. We wouldn't be here to celebrate without the Savior of the world. Mm. The lamb that was slain. We say worthy, worthy. Mm.
powerful than the matchless name of Jesus. We glorify the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Worthy is your name. Holy is your name. Righteous is your name. Beautiful is your name. Majestic is your name in all the earth. Continue to be exalted. Continue to be lifted up. Above every circumstance, above every thought that's not like you. All glory and honor be to you. The people of God this morning, can you join me and say amen?
about you, but that, that's my story. That, that's my story. I was lost. Spiritually, I was unhealthy. My identity was found in so many other things. But Christ came to my rescue. I was dead in my trespasses and sin. But Christ changed my story. He sent his son, Jesus, and gave me the opportunity to place my faith in him so that I can become spiritually alive and change my story. And now my soul is well. Now it is well in my soul. Can I get an amen? Maybe it's not only my story, maybe it's your story also. And the goal of this series is for us to become well, well as a church, well in our finances, well as people of God and emotionally and mentally well. Because God wants us to be well. Amen? You're probably saying, what is that pretty lady there standing with you? Are you trying to show off? Yes, that's what I'm trying to do. But before we dive into the text this morning, last week we prayed for our brothers and sisters in Haiti who have lost so many loved ones. The number keeps climbing every day. So today, before we dive into the Word of God, we want to pray one more time for Haiti. But beyond just praying, I want to give you an opportunity to be generous, to do something kind. For the next two weeks, we're going to be collecting an offering. This week, you can just put it on an envelope and say Haiti, or if you're giving online, you can put it in the giving box, Haiti, and everything that you give that says Haiti will go to Haiti. Whether you put it in the box or you give online, and then next week we'll have a walk-up offering. We want to collect an offering, and we're going to partner with the IMB, the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptists, and the SEND Network, who already have churches in Haiti and missionaries in Haiti. And we're not going to send it to an organization and then they take 40 off the top. We're going to send it to leaders and pastors in Haiti so they can do good works in this season where there's so much need. And so my wife, her parents are from Haiti, and I asked her to come and pray for the people of Haiti. So would you bow your head right where you are and pretend like you're pointing towards Haiti with your hand, point towards my wife, and let us pray for Haiti. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time. <clears throat> I thank you for just allowing us to come together in this fashion, Lord God. And I just pray, Father, that as we pray, Lord God, that we be one body, one spirit, one mind, Lord God, and that you would be Lord over Haiti, Lord God, that you would be the Lord of Haiti, Lord, that they would know that you love them, that you see them, that you see all the devastation and all the destruction, Lord God, and the people sleeping in the tents, Lord God. Lord God, you see all those things, Lord. You see those who are in need of food and shelter and medicine and all the things that I haven't said, Lord God, you see them, all the hurting, all the ones that are looking for lost loved ones, Lord God. I pray, Father, that you be Lord over Haiti today, that you just give them your peace, that you surround them with your peace right now in the name of Jesus. I pray that they'll be, have no peace like no other, like the song says that they would have no peace like no other. Lord God, that they would rest their heads upon you, Lord God, because you give us peace. You give us strength to move forward, Lord God, and that you give us the strength and the boldness to do everything that we need to do. So I pray, Father, that, these, that the people of Haiti would look to you, Lord God, for boldness, for strength, for peace for serenity, Lord God, in this time of destruction, Lord. Lord God, we need your love, we need your peace, Lord God. I pray for the finances of this ministry, Lord God, as we give, Lord God, that we give generously and know that your funds will be used in a mighty way. Lord God, I just pray, Lord, that you just, you just be with Haiti. You be with them in a special way. 
that you would touch, that they would feel your love and your peace, that they would know that you love them, Lord God. You created them, that you know them all by name, and that you would touch them from the crown of their heads to the sole of their feet. Lord God, and I just pray, Father, that you be Lord over the service today. As we give, Lord God, you would give us an open heart, an open mind, and everything would be used to your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Can we give it up one good time for the Lord? If you have a Bible, whether it's paper or screen, would you journey with me to the book, the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter? Uh, let us hear the voice of Jesus. If you're a note taker, today's message is entitled, A Healthy Disciple. Yes, we are a healthy church, and God wants us to be a healthy church. And reminding us that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church wants to be healthy in our finances and be good stewards of what God is giving us. But the end goal of our salvation isn't just going to heaven. God wants us to be disciples. He wants us to be men and women who are fully devoted to following him. And so let's see what he says about a disciple in John, the 15th chapter. If you're watching online and you found the text, Go ahead and type in the chat box, I got it. And then for you who are here in person, you shout through your mask, say, I got it. Yeah, look at what he says in his word. Verse one, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already cleaned because of the word I have spoken over you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch, say no branch, can bear fruit by itself. It remains in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Say, that's me, y'all. <laughs> Give you one more chance. Say, that's me, y'all. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my word remain in you, ask whatever you wish, uh, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you may bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. If you feel comfortable, would you put your palms up as a sign of receiving, but also as a sign of surrender. Let us pray. God, we do not deserve your mercy or your grace, but God, we are so grateful that you came to our rescue, that our identity is now wrapped in you, that God, you are our sustainer, that you are our redeemer, that you are the one who gives us sustenance. God, we, we thank you that in you we live and move and have our very be. Now, God, would you, would you hide me behind the cross? Would you preach? Would you teach me? I'd be nothing more than a vessel being used for your glory. God, speak to your people today. May they hear a word from you and not my opinion. God, move in this place. In Jesus' name. If you agree, would you shout amen? Say it one more time. Say amen. I want to begin our time today by talking about an application that so many of us have on our phones. Uh, if you have a smartphone, uh, many of these smartphones come with this application. 
For some of you, you, there's different variations of this application. Maybe you have more than one of this kind of app on your phone. For some of you, you have the, the app called Waves. And it is a GPS app, and I have a member who says, Pastor, you need to download Waves because Waves is the best GPS app out there. I mean, he was selling it like it was, woo. And he said, here's why it's so good. He said, it's so good because when I'm speeding, is what he said to me, it shows me where the cops are so I can slow down. I said, so you speed? I said, me too. <laughs> there are others of you who say Waze is okay. It, it takes up too much uh, data on your phone. Uh, some of you are saying, like, like, Google Maps is the thing, right? Like, you're a Google Maps fan. You love Google Maps. You're, you probably came here today. If you're a first-time visitor, you probably found your way here today because you, you went in Google Maps and you typed in the location and it brought you turn by turn. Make a right on Davy Road. Make a left on 72nd. And then it says, to your right is the church. You arrived. Now, those of you are like me, you're an Apple guy. But I must say, even though I'm an Apple guy, Apple does 90 things better than the other phones, in my humble but accurate opinion. But the one thing that I think the other phones have going over Apple is the Google Maps. Yeah, that, the Google Maps is better than the Apple Maps. The Apple Maps had me lost one or two times. The Google Maps, I think they update that thing every single day. Like, they, they, they update it every day. But what you have to understand about whether you have Waves or you have Google Maps or, or, you, or you have Apple Maps. I see my brother leaning and say, you better talk good about my phone. Listen, listen, wherever, whatever you have, you have to understand this. You might know where you want to go, but in order for the, the application to really tell you how to get there, it has to know your starting point. And you're like, well, it always does because it's following you. It knows where you're going. It's tracking you. I know they say, well, we don't track you anymore. They're lying. <laughs> and that's why when you open up your app, when you put in the, where you want to go, the, 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 the destination, you, you get there because it knows where your starting point is. But too often, when it comes to spiritual things, we don't know where we are. Too often, when it comes to the things of the faith, we don't know where we're called to start. He said, you have to understand this, that the biggest man you're ever going to see was once a baby in his life. The biggest tree you're ever going to see was once a seed. Every plant, most plants, their starting point is a seed. And eventually it finds soil. And once it finds soil, if it has the right environment, it'll grow. And if it even has the right environment, if it's, a, if it's a seed that is called to bear fruit, then it more than just grow, but it will go towards the destination, which is bearing fruit. Jesus tells us that as believers, the destination isn't just to go to heaven. It, 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 he wants us to be those who are called mature believers. The word in the, in the Greek is teleos. He wants us to be mature in our faith. He wants us to have a starting point, lost, broken, in sin. But he wants to rescue us and start doing a work in us that we can't do to ourselves so that we could bear fruits. Love, patience, kindness, goodness. Patience in another language is long-suffering. In the text we read this morning, Jesus wants us to know that we are called to be those who will bear fruit. And you're saying, how am I going to do that? How, how am I going to bear fruit? Look at the text one more time. He tells us, he, he wants us to understand a couple of things. We'll see it in verse 1 and verse 5. If you understand anything, if you're going to bear any kind of fruit, you have to understand what's going on here. <laughs> Number one, he says to us in verse 1, he says, I am the true vine. Say true. And we're going to come back to that in a moment. And my father is the gardener. Then he goes on to verse 5 and says again, I am the vine and you are 
the branches. In this process, he wants us to know that he is the true vine, not just a regular vine, not just one of those other vines we see in Isaiah uh, or, or in Proverbs or even in Revelations. He's saying, I'm the true vine. We're going to get to that in a moment. Then he talks about his dad, his father, our heavenly father, being the gardener who tends to the garden, who tends to us. And then and my, 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 my former guy is shaking his head, and then he says to us again, I am the vine. And he says, you. Say me. Say it aloud. Say me. One more time. Say me. We are branches. Let's deal with the first point. He says, I am the true vine. What that means is that there are other vines that aren't true. And what you need to understand is that a vine is one that gives source and life and sustenance to the branches. Write this down as point number one. Jesus is the source to our well-being. He didn't just say, I'm a vine. Or I am the vine. He gets to that in verse 5. Before he says, I am the vine, he says, I am the true vine. In Isaiah, the, in Isaiah, the word of God says in Isaiah, the fifth chapter, he, said, he talks about another vine. It'll be on the screen if you, if you want to follow along. He says it's about this vine. He says, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one, I had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up, cleared the stones, and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out the wine press as well. Then he looked for crops. He has a, it is a vine that's there, and he's looking for crops. He's looking for good grapes, and look what he says. But it yielded only bad fruit. We go on to tell you what it says. And now you deliverers in Jerusalem, people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What could have been done for my vineyard? that I have not done for it. When I looked for good grapes, why did it only yield bad ones? Say bad ones. In this text, he is pointing to Israel. (laughs) He's saying that Israel was the vineyard he planted, and it was supposed to be a vineyard that would bear good fruit, but when he went there, all he could find was bad fruit. Not only could he, could he only find bad fruit, he said, I found wild grapes. What, what did Israel produce? What, what Israel produced was it proved to be unfaithful and unfruitful. It proved to be unfaithful and unfruitful. When he curses the fig tree, it really points back to Israel, who has all these leaves but no fruit. When he tells Hosea to go, to go and, and, and get that lady who was unfaithful, it points to how he keeps coming after us, the, even when we're not faithful. And then he says to us, I am the true vine. David Gothic would say it this way. In contrast, Jesus is the vine. We must be rooted in him, not in Israel, not in our stuff, not in our finances, if we will bear fruit for God. In the New Covenant community, our first identification is not in the name of a church. It's in Jesus himself. Not in Israel, not in a denomination, not in the, the home you live in or the area you live in. You see, Israel was unfaithful and unfruitful. But God came to make us fruitful. Israel could not follow the law, but Christ came to fulfill the law. The Israel could not lead us to faith, and so he came so that we could have faith. And by faith, be justified and find life in Christ. The path to God does not go through your works. The path to God does not go through Israel. The path to God does not go through a denomination. The path to God goes through Jesus. You should shout over that. Can I get an amen? And so if Jesus is divine, he is our sustainer. He is where we find sustenance. If he is divine, he is the where we find satisfaction. Ooh, but I'm going to tell you, to be honest, even though Christ is making that claim that he is the true vine, that he is divine, and that we are the branches, if we are, to be honest, we have other vines all in our closet. We have vines in our back pocket. We have vines in our lives. And I'm going to talk about your vines. <laughs> Some of you, your vine is yourself. You are your vine. 
And that's why you're, you're going to do you. That's why you're probably saying, I'm going to live my truth. Ooh. That's why you're saying, I am enough. And then you sing songs that says, I am enough. But if you listen to the folks from, from Maverick Seed that says, I am not enough because you are enough. <laughs> what does that mean? That means I'm not enough. And I'm only enough because I'm attached to the vine. See, some of you, you are your vine. But if you understand the gospel, you're not called to do you. You're called to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him. You're called to die to yourself. You're not called to live your truth. There's no truth in you. You're called to pursue the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> you are not enough because he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so if you are your vine, that's a bad vine to be on. Huh? For some of you, your vine, you're not going to like this. Your vine, if you're married, is your spouse. And you think you're going to find sustenance and satisfaction in your spouse. And you get mad when you don't find sustenance and satisfaction in your spouse. Let me help you. Your spouse is not a vine. He or she is just a branch. Ooh. And so you're trying to find sustenance and satisfaction and, and, and vigor and life in some other branch, but you can never find it in another branch. That's why he says, I am the vine. Remain in me. Abide in me. Men know in me. And we're trying to remain in a spouse. Some say, I'm single, so I'm okay. Well, you, maybe you find, your, your branch is <laughs> your job or your career or your education, and you're trying to find satisfaction in your job, and so you want another raise, or another job, or, or, or a bigger title, and, and you realize that even when you get that new job, or that new career, or that new business, real quickly, you're no longer satisfied, and you go after more, because you will never be satisfied. Whether they pay you 100K, or 150K with a bonus, whether what you might think it's the house that will satisfy you, but even when you get another house, after a couple of years in the house, you're like, you know, I wish I had a bigger one. Jesus is saying to us, I am divine, not your money. I am divine, not your career. I am divine, not your culture, not, not your spouse. You're not divine. There's no truth in you. I am the truth. You, you, I, don't just live your best life. Live the life I've called you to live. He says to us, I am divine. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, your satisfaction is not found in anything else but Jesus. And if you try to pursue substance and satisfaction in anything else, you will always be unhealthy, especially spiritually. Some of you are spiritually drained and unhealthy because you're not looking for substance in Jesus, you're looking for it elsewhere. You're, you're trying to find it somewhere else, and then you want to sign Christ's name to it. And you're saying, well, Jesus, I, I claimed it. I prayed it in your name. Why don't I feel satisfied? Because he says, I am enough. You might not believe that, so let's go to point number two. Write this down if you're a note taker. The Father cultivates us so we can bear more fruit. Say more fruit. Say it a little loud in that same more fruit. Look at verse 2. He says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. One of the things about a vineyard is, yes, the branches uh, need the vine. It is the vine that provides substance and satisfaction to the branches. But there are other things that, that they need, what they need the most is the vine, but there are other things in our lives that we need that God has placed in our lives because we need them. Number one, if you're a, vine, if you're a part of the vine and we're branches, we need support. Say support, y'all. If you, I've got a vine in my backyard. It's, it's one of them uh, passion fruit vines, and 
and I put up a little bit of support, right? And real quickly, it was looking for more support, and I didn't have enough support, so it starts going all over my tree, my sour sap tree, and my, 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 my sugar apple tree, and it was going all over the place because every vine wants support. You and I, we need support. No one's an island. We're called to do life together. We're never called to do life alone, and if you try to do this thing God has called you to do on yourself, you will go cocoa for Cocoa Pops because you need each other. We need one another. In Romans 12, in verse, verse 10, it tells about this support. It says this, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, in brotherly love. You don't know that song. The kids know that song. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor each other above yourselves. If we're going to do anything for the kingdom of God, we need to be reminded to the vine because he is the one who supplies what we need. But he designed it so that we could work together and so that we would need one another and so that we can carry one another's burdens. We're not called to live in isolation. We're called to be devoted to one another. There's a devotion that happens when we understand who we are in Christ. Not only devoted to each other, but we need to be devoted to the word. So if, the, if, if, if one another is like support, then the word is like the soil. We need the word in our lives. Here's what Paul says in Romans, uh, the, the 10th chapter, verse 17. He says this, so then faith, say faith. Say it a little louder. Say, say faith. Consequently, faith comes from hearing and hearing of the word of? We need the word in our lives. We need the word so that as we get support, as we get sustenance from God, we need the soul in our lives to be renewed daily, renewed daily. That's why the writer in Psalm says, uh, uh, day and night I'm in your word and I'm like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. We need to renew the soul daily. That's why you got to find time to get in your word. And you say, I don't have no time, but you watch Fox News, CNN, MSNBC for 30 hours a week. I don't do that. You're on WhatsApp. Uh, you're, you're, you're on Facebook. You're on Instagram. I do it too. You scroll, you scroll, you scroll, you scroll. You like, you like. You scroll, you scroll, you scroll. It's somebody's business. You scroll, you scroll, you scroll, you scroll, you scroll. And an hour later... Can we give God 15, 20 minutes of our time for him to till the soil in our lives so that we could not only get support from each other, not only be sustained and have sustenance from the vine, but, but can we allow the soil in our lives to, to be renewed daily so that we could continue to grow in our faith? I think I'm preaching good. I'm not sure if you feel that way, but I think I am. You see, God isn't just having you in a rinky-dink vineyard. I, I've been to some rinky-dink vineyards that just kind of, everything goes, goes wild and there's no one there to attend it. But he told us not only is he the true vine, he says, I have a father who is the gardener. What does the gardener do? The gardener tends to the vine. Woo. And he goes to see if we are connected, if we are manu, remaining in Christ, and he says if we're remaining and we are bearing fruit, then he comes. He comes like a good gardener and he prunes back so that we can be more fruitful. Uh, let me help you understand this concept. And I'm going to say some words that some of you don't like, but that's how I felt when I was young. When I was young, my mom, she would talk on the phone a lot, and I would listen to her. I heard almost everything she was saying on the phone. Why am I saying that? Parents, when you're on the phone, your kids are listening. You might think they're not. You might think they're tweeting and they're on Instagram where they got their headphones in, but one's probably out and they're hearing everything you say. And I overheard my mom saying to her cousin, who was like one of her best friends, she says, Melinda, I shouldn't have called her name, but I did, who cares? Melinda, I, I, I want to I grow my hair. I, I want to I have my hair grow longer. I, I, I'm, I, I just want to grow my hair. And after she was done being on the phone with her, her cousin, she did what I thought was the dumbest thing. She washed her hair, and then she, she combed it out, and, and then she went and she grabbed this big scissors. And I was like, oh, are you? 
she started clipping her hair. And I said, if you want your hair to grow, just don't cut it. And I had the, the gusto to go to my mom and say, Mom, how is your hair going to grow if you keep cutting it? And she said this profound thing that I didn't understand until later on in life. She said, I have to cut it because I have split ends. And she said, if I cut the split ends, it will make room for the hair to grow healthier. You see, we have a heavenly father who is a good gardener, who is cutting back things that once upon a time was productive, that bared fruit in our lives so that we could bear more fruit. And you're saying, God, why are you cutting that? Because once upon a time it bare fruit, but if you want to bear more fruit, I got to cut back some things in your life. You're clapping now, but when he starts cutting, you're mad. God, why did you cut that friend? God, why did you cut that job? God, God, why, why did you cut that neighborhood? God, God, why did you cut my finances? God, God, why, 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 God, why? And you, you couldn't give earlier, but when he cut your finances, you realized you can live on less. You thought you had to live on all of it. When he cut back your finances, you learned that I can live on less. Let me, let me go. Ooh. You see, the gardener comes to make us more fruitful, but when you prune things in your life that was once upon a time productive, you see, you remembered when that, that branch once upon a time used to bear fruit, but every once in a while, you gotta cut back old branches so that you can give life to new ones. You see, my guy is a, a landscaper, and, and, and if you don't cut back some old branches, it will hinder the new ones to grow the way they're supposed to grow. And when you have these half-dead branches in your life that God wants to cut off, but you light them because you go back to the old days. Remember when we had that branch? <laughs> I ain't got time to really go where I want to go. We have a father who loves us so much and when we remain connected to the vine, he comes in our lives and says, I, I see that. That branch, I gotta cut it so that you could bear more fruit. But if you remain connected, we will bear fruit. And the fruit that we bear is a byproduct of what Jesus is really doing in our lives. Point, point number three, true connection to Christ produces fruit. Say it with me. Say, true connection to Christ produces fruit. I remember when I was growing up, I made a promise to myself that when I get married and I have kids, I'm going to spend a whole lot of time with my kids. I'm going to invest a lot of time with my kids. And so every summer, we'll take two and three weeks off. We'll go to the Virgin Islands and hang out. Sometimes we'll go on road trips. I remember one time we went on this long road trip with my kids. Our first stop was Tampa. We went to Tampa. My kids were small at the time. I wanted to go to the Bush Gardens because I love roller coasters. My kids were too small for roller coasters. And I was like, honey, let's go with them anyway. They'll, they'll come. And she's like, no, you're not taking my kids on no roller coaster. No, no, shikra. You're not taking them on the shikra to drop... Honey, no. I said, all right, all right, baby, you're, you're right. Amen? I thought you wise would have liked that one, but you didn't. I thought, we were having a good time in the lazy pool, jumping off of my son. My, my son at the time, he was very young. He was small. He was about Nathan's age, and he jumped into this pool that was like 10 feet, 10 feet, 10 feet, and he thought he could. He jumped in. I'm like, oh, my God, it's my son. I had to run in behind him and jump in, and he's there. <laughs> And he almost died, and I was like, jumped in, and I was swimming, and I said, glory to God. No, 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 no pictures, no pictures. Turn on your phone. We went to this other ride, this big ride, this, this tall ride, and I said, honey, are you coming with us? And, and my wife is a security pants. She said, no, I'm not going with you. I'm like, no fun. Let's go, kids. And the kids were going, and I was like, yeah, and we were running, and we're climbing, and we're going higher, and the higher we went, I was like, oh, snap, I think, 
I think this might be a little too, too, too um, high for them. And they, they were smart. They looked back at me, and I was confident, and they were kept going, and they were going, and I kept climbing, and I kept climbing, and I was like, whoa, this is not too high for me. And, uh, and I just kept going and kept going and, and looked back, and they didn't seem like, oh, okay, cool. And I said, okay, Emmanuel, you go first. Now, some of you would say, you think that you, I send him first because I want to make sure that when I get down there, they're all down there, and we can just kind of go. And because his mom is down there. No, I sent him first because I wanted to make sure if, if he was scared and the other one said, let's go back, I would be fine with going back. <laughs> so, the, so the big one went, and he went down, and he held his leg. The guy said, hold, bend your knees, and he hold it. And he goes, whoosh, whoosh. And I'm like, oh, holy, holy. <laughs> And then the, the, the middle one went, and he was like, he, he, he don't even care. He jumped on it. I'm like, Noah, please hold on, because if, if you let go, you might fall over. I'm good, Daddy. And now, and now I'm like, if I walk down these stairs and my two boys go, I'm going to look like a scary pants. I went down. My heart was kind of pumping a little bit. I went up, went down, and I went down, and I was like, oh my God. And then when you get close to the end, you're like, yeah, 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 let's go. We high five in, and I was gonna high five my little son. He said, Daddy, I wanna pee. So we ran to the bathroom and told him to pee. Now I came back out, and here's the second one, my second son. I, I, I wanna pee too. And I'm like, well, your mom's not here, and um, you go. No, no, I don't wanna go out. Come with me, Daddy. I gotta watch your, your brother. Come with me, Daddy. I said, all right. Will you stay here? Which I should have known was not a dumb a question to ask uh, like a five-year-old. Yeah, yeah, daddy. I turned around for 30 seconds. All right, son, this is as far as I want to take you. Go now, go, go, go. I turned around, and he was gone. And I said, okay, maybe he went ran to his mom. And then his mom came with no, no kid. And then for seven minutes, the worst seven minutes of my life. I'm only thinking about, he jumped in the 10 feet pool and he couldn't, he couldn't swim on his own. I ran back to the pool, he's not there. Maybe he went on the other slide and I went to the other slide. I run, ran around that part and that seven minutes felt like a whole day and I couldn't believe my son was lost. See, Jesus wants us to remain in him, I mean, knowing him. Because if we don't remain in him, we're lost. He says, if you're lost, you're not in me. You're good for nothing. You see, if we don't abide, if we don't know, we will be lost and fruitless. And we will be those branches that wither. And all we're really good for is a forest fire. We are healthy when we live our lives in Christ. When we are nourished by the vine, we will produce fruit. If we remain in Christ, we will produce fruit in a couple of areas in our lives. Number one, fruit in our relationships with our family. If you are not seeing fruit in your family, maybe you're not connected to Christ. Not everyone's fruit is the same. So don't go judge fruit and copy fruit and say, well, my fruit should be like his fruit. Because you see that fruit he has on Instagram? Instagram fruit is not real fruit. And even if you, have, if you spend time with individuals and maybe they, they, he loves on his wife and his wife respects him, and, and then you, all you're looking for is minimal fruit and you want, you want, you want to remain connected because if you, if you just remain, if you're just patient and remain in him, I guarantee you, you'll bear fruit. It's not about working hard. It's not a, I've never seen a, a, a branch that, mm, it just remains. Fruit in our relationship with others. Fruit that testifies about the truth of the gospel. Fruit, most of all fruit, that points to the glory of God. Here's one fruit you should see in the life of a Christian. In every life of a Christian, you should see the fruit of love. Say love. Say it again. Say love. Love for who? Number one, love for God. And in John 15 and 14, here's what the Bible says. If you love God, you will do what he says. And if you truly love God, then you will love others. 
You see, Siobhan was singing a while ago, freedom. And yes, that is scripture. Galatians 5 and 13 says we have been set free. He says, but don't use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Instead, we ought to use our freedom to serve one another in, in humble love. Listen, we are called to love God, but we shall also see the love that goes beyond just loving God. Because when we really love God, we'll love others. Pastor Ephraim did this analogy one time. I'm going to steal it from him. He said, so many of us, we brag about our fruit, and we think the fruit is for us. He said, I've never seen a tree that ate its own fruit. He said, he said I've never seen a tree that, mm, mm, oh, my fruit's so good. Uh, mm, mm, ooh, mm, that mango is so good. Mm, strings in my mouth. Mm, that, that, that June plum is good. Oh, mm, that sour sap is so good. So good. So good. Mm, mm. Yes, that apple is good. So good. Mm, so good. But yet we think the fruit that we produce is for us. The fruit is for God's glory and the fruit is for others. And if you can only understand that the fruit that God wants to bear in your life has nothing to do with you. That fruit is for the glory of God. That fruit is to help others who are in need. The tree never eats the fruit. The tree, tree remains in, on the vine and it bears fruit that brings glory to the creator of the universe, that brings glory to the sustainer and the satisfier, and it also helps others. The fruit you're bearing is not for you. It's for your neighbor and your friends and your relatives and your spouse and your associates. It's for other people. It's for your brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. We must abide because we are dependent on God. You're not dependent on you. You can't push a little harder. You got to remain in him. The word remain means mental. Mental means abiding. And I believe the secret to a successful prayer life is to remain. I know time is well spent, but I'm not going to skip this verse because there's somebody who's going to say, Pastor, I know you, you didn't want to go into that verse. That's why you took so long to get there. Let's get to verse 7. Look what it says. If you remain in me and my word remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. The Father's glory that you may bear much fruit. Let me give you what William Donald says and then I'll tell you what I said the text is saying. He says this, the closer you get to the Lord, the more you will learn what he thinks, his thoughts. The more you will know him through his word, the more you will understand his will, the more our will will become his will. The more our will agrees with his will, the more we can be assured that we will have a successful life, prayer life. Let's go back to the text. You, you can't, before you get to that part where he says pray whatever you want, you got to remain what he says in the very beginning. What does he say? He says, he says if, you, if you remain in me, if you remain in me, and not only remain in me, meno in me, but if you remain, meno in my word, what you wish for will be different than what you wish for before that. You see, when you don't remain in him, and you don't remain in his word, you will ask for stupid stuff, selfish stuff, fleshly stuff. But when you remain in him, and you remain in his word, what you're going to wish for will be different than what you would have wished for before you remained. Jesus in Gethsemane, he had a desire, a wish that a couple passed him by and he went on his knees and he menowed and went before the Father and says, Father, if it is possible, he knew it was possible, would you let this cup pass me by? And, his father, and it instantly he said, you know what, that's what I really want, but not my will, but thy will be done. I know you wouldn't be happy about that, but that's the text. Here's the last point. True disciples bear fruit for the glory of God. True disciples bear fruit for the glory of God. The text says, 
All of this, all, all this stuff with the, him being the true vine, all that stuff with him being the gardener who comes into your garden and prunes back the branches that are no longer fruitful, or okay, some gardeners prune back whatever they want. Some gardeners prune back whatever they want. You're like, but God, hold on, not, not that branch, not, 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 not that branch, but true gardeners can prune back whatever they want. Sometimes they prune back branches because it's blocking a view. <laughs> Sometimes they prune back branches to make room for other trees. All that stuff, him being divine and we are the branches, all that stuff, all the, the bearing fruit and, and bearing much fruit and then bearing more fruit, all, all those things, all, all that stuff, I'm getting to the point, all those things, all that stuff, why did he do all those things for me? So he can show off how fruitful I am, so he can show off how fruitful our church is, so he can show me off on social media, so he can show me off in my marriage, I can say to my, uh, my husband, I'm more fruitful than you. I can say to my wife, I'm more fruitful. Or you can show off to your brothers and sisters, I, I don't curse, I'm fruitful. It's not for any of that. He does all those things for one reason. He says this in verse 8, this is to my Father's glory. That you, that you would bear much fruit. And when you bear much fruit, you'll be showing yourself to be my matitis. You'll show yourself to be my disciple, the one who is remaining, who is fully devoted to following me. But, but even your fruit and your discipleship is a byproduct of the real product. You might not like this. The real product isn't your fruit. The real product isn't you being a disciple. The real pro but, but God, God said when he made humanity, it was very good. But before he made humanity, he says, come, let us make humanity in our image so that they can fill the earth with those who bear the image of God. God is concerned about his glory and the fruit and discipleship is a byproduct of what God is doing. What is God doing? He wants his glory. Isaiah says, I was created by God and for God and for his glory. You're married, yes. When you love your wife, it's not about you showing the world you can love your wife, it's about pointing to his glory. Children, when you obey your parents in the Lord, it's not about saying, I'm a good kid, I'm better than him. No, it's about pointing to his glory. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. Divine sustains us and satisfies us. The gardener, he tends to our garden and he prunes back branches that were once fruitful. He, pr he prunes back whatever branch he wants so that you can bear much fruit, so that you can bear more fruit. And he's calling us to be those who would support one another because when we bear fruit, it's not for the tree. When we bear fruit, it's not for the branches. When we bear fruit, it's for his glory. And the byproduct of us bearing fruit is helping others. And when we help others, It'll point to his glory. A healthy disciple knows the gospel and he's sharing the gospel. A healthy disciple remains in scripture. A healthy disciple submits to the things of God. A healthy disciple has a healthy prayer life where we say, Lord, I'm remaining in your word and I'm coming before you 
God, I know what I wanted, but, but not my will, but let your will be done. And God, if your will is loving and serving others, empower me to do so. Because I want to be a branch that bears fruit and points to your glory. Father, we thank you right now for your word. God, I pray today that if there's someone who is here today who have not placed their faith in you, God, today may they know, Lord God, that they, they're not divine. It is not them or their spouse or their girlfriend or their boyfriend. It's you. You are divine. You are the true vine. And all we are are branches. God, may we remain, abide in you. God, there's some who have been remaining for a while and they're not seeing any fruit. And God, they want to detach. But God, will they just wait and trust in the Lord? Will they not wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength? God, would you allow us to be a church that will bury our will for yours? That will bury our preferences for yours? God, would you do a work in us as a church? We want to bear fruit because we want you to be glorified. Your glory is our reward for your glory, but yet for our good. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Could we stand as we sing? We are here to have every era of our lives surrendered to and pointing to the glory of Jesus. There is no other name in heaven, on earth, or under the earth, that is as great as the name of Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. His name is exalted far above the earth. His name His name is exalted far above the earth. Give glory and honor and praise unto His name. No other name but the name of Jesus. No
announcements and prayer. Maybe you're here today and you've been trying to find satisfaction and identity and substance and value in something else other than the true vine. Because there are other vines. Some of them are past vines like Israel. And all they produce is wild grapes. Some of them are vines that are idols that we've created in our lives. Some of those vines are, it's you. Today I want to invite you to menu, to abide, to remain in the true vine. Because if you remain in the vine, you'll bear fruit. Then the Father is going to come and prune back so you can bear even more fruit. And he'll keep tending to the garden so you can bear much fruit. But today I want you to remain and abide because this is what Jesus said. Apart from me, you can't do anything. And I don't believe he's a liar. I believe he's the truth. Right where you are, if you're watching online, if you're here in person, let's pray together. Maybe you're praying for the very first time. If you're praying, let's pray to encourage somebody else. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for being the true vine. Today, I remain. I abide. I rest in you. My identity is in you. My satisfaction is in you. Allow me to remain so that I can bear fruit for your glory. I confess I'm a sinner and I need your grace. So by faith, I believe in you. And by faith, I want to remain in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, chance together real quickly. If you're watching online and you pray that prayer for the very first time, there's a link below, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, you can click on that link and you can fill out a connect card and say, today I pray to receive Christ. We're going to call you. We're going to come looking for you because we want to help you to remain in him. And if you're here in person and you pray that prayer for the first time, don't leave without either coming to the altar or filling that connect card because we want you to grow in your faith. A couple of things before we leave. Number one, for those who want to give to Haiti, you can get an envelope, you can put Haiti on it, and every dime you give will go towards helping those who are in Haiti who, who have need. If you're watching online, whether you use Tidally or you click on our giving app, just put in a note box, Haiti, and every dime will go to helping those who are in need. Next week we'll have a walk-up offering for those who feel comfortable to come to the front to give their offering so we can help those of our brothers and sisters who are in Haiti. Number two, uh, next week we're going to have a conversation about emotional and mental health. And so if you want to send a question, you can email info at metrobc.us or go on our website and send a question. We're going to have Dr. Sidbury and Dr. Vassal be here. We have a conversation about emotional and mental health. And then lastly, this is the first week in both Broward and Day County where all our kids are going back to school. Uh, last week in Broward County, on Wednesday, some of our kids went back to school. But this week on Monday, all of our kids are going back to school. And usually around this, on this day, we would call the kids forward to pray. We would call the teachers forward to pray. Um, and we're going to do that. And if you feel comfortable, you can bring them. If not, it's okay. God hears our prayer wherever you are. But I believe as a church, we have to pray. This is the time where teachers are scared for their lives. And, and once upon a time, it was because of a gun that a kid may bring to the school, but now it's not even because of a gun. And our kids are going back. They're going back. And so we're going to pray. Because the Word of God says, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman watches in vain. Yeah. So if you're a teacher, Everyone have a seat. If you're a teacher, 
or your kids are going to school, you can either stand or come to the altar. Wherever you are, and if you're a believer, this is, this is not time for you to leave yet. I want you to pray for those who are going back. So if you're a teacher or your kids are going to school, whether you either stand or you can come and we're going to pray. And if you have kids, would you stand with your kids? And if you have grandkids, we need to be praying. I'm going to put you in a spot. I hope, I, hope, I hope you're okay with this. Brother Rama, would you come? Would you pray over our children and I'll pray over our teachers. You go ahead and pray for us. there's part of me this morning that doesn't even really know how to do this. There's a sickness around us and we can't see it. We don't know where it is. We don't know what it's doing. And it has a mind of its own. And yet we serve a God who is on the throne who's sovereign over creation and sovereign over every aspect of his creation. So we come before you, sovereign God, this morning, and we ask you to protect our children. We ask you to watch over them and keep them and care for them and protect them in, in ways that we as parents and grandparents and friends and siblings just absolutely cannot do. We recognize that you are able and we abide in you this morning and we pray that you would do what we cannot do. We pray for our children as they go to school tomorrow and in the days to come. Father, let them be light in a dark place. Let them bring health into an unhealthy climate. Let them witness to their peers and to their teachers and the administrators in the schools in ways that maybe parents and teachers can't do. Let them take Jesus with them and live in such a way that you are glorified. Lord, would you use our children? Would you protect our children? Would you be glorified through our children's lives, we pray? In Jesus' name. And so, Father, now I pray for our teachers. As my brother prayed earlier, that our kids are called to be salt and light on their campus. They're called to be missionaries to the largest mission field in America, the school campus. And God, I pray, Lord God, that not only would our students be missionaries, but I pray for our teachers. I pray, Lord God, that they will be missionaries on the campus. That God, with the way they teach and the way they love the children, Lord God, and God, they would see, Lord God, that the teacher is different. That they will serve our children in humble love. That God, their fruit will be seen, not only with our children, but God, with their co-workers, those who are far from God, those who are seeking fruit in else places, and those who don't know the true vine. God, may you bear fruit in their lives that will empower them, Lord God, to go and be salt and light on their campus for your glory and for your honor. But God, we also ask for your protection. God, would you protect our teachers God, would you cover them and keep them and watch over them, Lord God, in this difficult season. God, in difficult times, your word says, even when mountains crumble into the sea, we can be still and know that you are God. We can know that you are near. 
we can know that you are present. God, may they know that you are near. They have to go into the classroom with a spirit of fear, but they can go with love, power in a sound mind, and know, Lord God, that you will never leave them nor forsake them. So God, be with them now, both our teachers and our kids. Be glorified in Jesus' name. And the church says, amen. As they go back to their seats, we encourage them. As you go, I want you to know that you are a city on a hill, a light that shines in a dark place, so the world that is broken and lost can find hope in Jesus. Unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to show us faultless before the throne of grace, the only wise God, be dominion, power, and glory now and forevermore. And the church says, Amen.